very much. Uh, really, I just want to uh, welcome you all here today. I know that uh, there are a lot of people here this morning who uh, maybe have not visited us, uh, at least in the, in the recent past, and uh, I'd like to extend a special welcome uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, all of you, uh, really, uh, for being here. Uh, the conferences uh, that uh, Ted, David, and Jan have been uh, organizing in the, in the last few years uh, have become really an important part of the cultural life of the school uh, at this time of year. It's, a, it's an incredible opportunity to not only uh, bring back to the school uh, the, the, the school's alumni, its current students, but it really be has become uh, a forum for a range of uh, discussions to uh, develop specific topics. Um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago probably, I think we had a conference on French gardens. Uh, more recently, we had the conference on uh, disaster or utopia, the future of the countryside. Um, and of course, the, the topic uh, with, of this year's conference on restoration detailing has been chosen because I think that we also wish to uh, emphasize a slightly different focus, whereas in previous years, probably the emphasis has been primarily on the theoretical and historical um, context of the, of the conference by really addressing more the issues of, of how things are, are made and uh, uh, placing the emphasis on the design or the restoration side of things is also suggest a certain shift to go not only from theory to practice but from practice to theory and to really develop uh, uh, new ideas, new possibilities, what can we learn from uh, the act of, uh, of doing, doing things. And I think it's also the topic itself is very much uh, consistent uh, with a certain uh, wish uh, for the development of new areas of, of, uh, of thinking, research, and, uh, and making that's happening within the, uh, within the program uh, because uh, we are, in fact, going to start a new uh, master's and MA program um, in the year 2000 and from starting in the year 2002, uh, which really is, uh, is uh, uh, hoping very much to develop uh, many of these ideas. Also, I think in, 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 in line with, uh, with uh, the, some of the kind of current thinking in, in the program, uh, we are uh, going to develop a more focused path uh, within our MA in the histories and theories of architecture uh, program to enable those people who wish to pursue maybe a, a more uh, um, specific development of, uh, of uh, histories and theories of landscape that could happen through the MA uh, in the uh, histories and theories of architecture program. Um, I, I uh, <clears throat> also uh, want to uh, welcome, of course, many of the uh, different speakers who I think a, a lot of them are, are also coming from uh, a number of different institutions uh, to the AA and very much hope that uh, you have a great conference both today and uh, tomorrow. Uh, I now pass you on to David Jakes who will maybe make the introduction for the first speaker. Or are you going to make the first presentation? Because I know that, uh, yes? okay, great. No, because I thought that Lorna McCroby is, is, is not Lorna here. Is Lorna McCroby in the audience? She is not. Okay. <laughs> so I pass you on to Ted who will make the introduction. <laughs> So, hitch one, but we are getting straight over that because David will take her place and Lorna will speak when she arrives, let us hope. Uh, David, I think most of you already know, he is running this course here, he is the <coughs> academic coordinator, and uh, he is developing this course in new ways which he will doubtless explain to you. Uh, I've known him ever since early days in the Garden History Society, and you will have known him through books. The first ever really successful book on Georgian gardens by David, The Reign of Nature, uh, which I think everybody must have on their bookshelves. We're waiting for his book on the 17th century. We're waiting for his book on conservation, both of which are either hot or in the press, or I see them on the computer. So that will be coming along quite soon. And here is David to talk to you now 
on the second subject we had today, appropriate detailing, but that is the heart of the matter. Well, thanks, Ted. Much of what I'm going to talk about actually is inappropriate detailing, um, because, <laughs> because um, just to show you some of the um, horrendous examples um, of the... Now, this is perfectly okay. That's just a, um, a lead-in. Um, there have been a huge number of mistakes in restoration work. And you know the old adage that you can always t date a restoration. Well, it's true. You really can. It depends on your skill in doing so, of course. And if you, know, if you train yourself, you can, um, you can work out, well, you know, concrete edging, well, that's probably the 1970s, or um, type of, types of metals or materials or giveaways. Um, it's perfectly true that um, it's somebody who's skilled in the subject um, can always date a restoration. And the, the telltale signs are in the details. The parterre edges, the me um, maybe the metal edges, the litter bins, the, the service points, not so subtly inserted often, um, the concrete used instead of the stone, etc., etc. So we'll go on to have a look at... Um, the history of inappropriate detailing. Many of you may recognize this garden at Ashridge. This is one of the early uh, historicist uh, restorations uh, by, um, and this was by Humphrey Repton. If, if, you, uh, if you go there and have a look at these uh, at the various elements here, it's perfectly obvious, in fact, that it's a 19th century uh, design. The, the fountain is, in fact, in cast iron, you know, not in finely wrought stone. Um, the, uh, the design of the parterre is, is all wrong. Um, the material, the, the, the chippings and so forth, are not exactly what, what would have been used, and so on and so forth. You can, go, you can make up a catalogue of where this is wrong in detail. Now, what I'm not going to do is to say that these are bad, that these are therefore bad, because there are many poor restorations which turn out to be brilliant places to be in, like Villandry, for example. I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful place, although an atrocious restoration uh, for a number of reasons. But if they're attempting to be restorations, uh, let's be clear, uh, much of the work of the last 200 years has been absolutely frightful. Some of you on the second year of the course uh, will have uh, gone to Rome, or well, all of you, I think, actually went to Rome uh, earlier uh, this academic year. And this is one of the, the famous or iconic shots of what a Roman garden must have been like. But in fact, when we looked at this, the statues are in fact concrete. And if you look at the, the way that the... Um, the various plinths join up. They don't actually join up properly. So this is an example of what's called, in technical terms, anastylosis, which is putting back stones where you think they might have been. Um, and it's clearly it was got wrong. Um, despite that, you find generations of w garden historians of world garden history uh, will include shots like this to show you what a Roman garden was supposed to be like. I can have a knock at the French now, <laughs> and uh, this is one of their uh, favoured places. Uh, it's so uh, admired that you can see, in fact, that it's, this shot is from a calendar. It's one of the, sort of the great sites of, uh, of, of French tourism. But I want to point out to you uh, that, in fact, it's a fake. Um, there are two gardens in particular that I want to draw your attention to. One is the the garden at the bottom of the shot, uh, but on the other side of the, um, the water from the, uh, the turret. And the other one is the, which is, that's called the Jardin de Catherine de, Catherine de Medici. And the other one, the one with the topiary in it, that's the Jardin de Diane de Poitiers. Now, let's have a look at the, the first of those, the Jardin de uh, Catherine de Medici. This is what it was really like 200 years ago. Um, sorry, this is a poor shot. Um, 
but this is a print showing, in fact, it was part of a Jardin Anglais. Now, when the, the French businessman in the, 19, in the 1850s or maybe 40s decided to, quote, restore Chenonceau, it was unacceptable that there should be a Jardin Anglais up to the walls of his chateau. So uh, he in just simply invented a garden. Um, it, there never was a Jardin de um, Catherine de Medici. It was a complete uh, mid-19th century invention, that, that whole garden, uh, in order to eliminate a piece of unacceptable uh, Englishness uh, next to the house. And the other garden there, um, this is an attempt. Do you see the way that the, uh, the lavender has been um, or, uh, made into these squiggly bits? That's an attempt at brodery, do you see? Now, there's one problem with that. If it's supposed to be the Jardin de Diane de Poitiers, brodery wasn't actually invented until about 50 years after she died. Uh, so w when you go around and you're told that this is you know, an authentic garden of the 16th century, it's a damn lie. Um, again, it is an attempt in the mid-19th century um, to give an historicist feel for the garden. And people have actually forgotten what the real garden was like. In fact, we do know what the garden was like because there are some excellent drawings by, uh, on, uh, by Ducesso, uh, the originals of which are in the British Library here, uh, British Museum, I think. Um, and there are other things wrong with this so-called um, parterre. You know, the, uh, there shouldn't, of course, be grass where there ought to be sand. And the materials, the plant materials used in the um, plat bond uh, are all wrong. But nevertheless, it's been adopted as this sort of iconic garden of French garden history. Now, stunning, eh? Um, that is the, that's the garden of New Place at, uh, in Stratford-on-Avon, um, where it's associated with... Um, <laughs> it's a bit psychedelic, really, isn't it? Um, it, it? So it's a garden of the 1920s, in fact, uh, designed by a man called Ernest Law, who was the person who sort of really rediscovered the Tudor garden history of Hampton Court. Very interested also in Shakespeare, and so he was given the opportunity to make a Shakespearean garden here. In fact, what he did is he copied as much as he could from Thomas Hill's book uh, of the 1560s and 1570s. Um, and so he's combining some of the detail of the rails around the compartiment um, with the interlacing um, uh, patterns seen in later editions of Thomas Hill and he's filled the interstices um, with uh, all these wonderful uh, colored flowers. Well, of course, that's, that is, looks nothing like um, a Tudor garden. But nevertheless, we can still admire it um, for, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful show, isn't it? And then there's the arbor. And of course, arbors were not built like that. Um, arbors were, in fact, uh, built with timber that was bent around, so they, they had semicircular tops to them rather than octangular tops to them. Um, I suppose this was because they, they hadn't got the curved timber and this was cheap to build or something, but no, that is not what an arbor is like. Um, again, as with the garden from the 1920s. Um, that's a garden of the, in Hampton Court of the 1950s, um, and almost everything about that is wrong too. Uh, sorry it's such a poor shot, we'll move on. Chiswick. Um, when I cut my teeth uh, in the 80s on uh, restoration work, this is a print of, at the back of the house of the, um, the vista up to the exedra. And in the 19, 1950s, uh, there was a considerable debate as to how Chiswick should be restored. And there was a plan done of the various features that would be reinstated. Um, this, in fact, was done by um, a man called Fillimore, although really it was working in conjunction with Frank Clark. And this restoration of the 50s 
um, really reinstated everything on the wrong lines, literally. Um, so that, for example, if you see the, the left-hand patois, right, here, you can see that the, the lines converge on the obelisk there. In fact, they should not. They should have converged on the gate. Uh, that line there, um, that was correctly shown on the map, but when it was actually done, it went to the bridge. You know. So you can look at almost every single phase of restoration at Chiswick since, since, the, 1940s, sorry, since the 1840s, and almost everything was sort of out, of, out of true geometrically. And that, of course, is one of the issues for modern garden restoration. Um, what do you do about inaccurate earlier restoration? And there are no easy answers. Wo wonderful Westbury, um, this is the National Trust. This was a design of a parterre uh, which was by the house. It just so happens that they put it about 150 <laughs> yards away. They thought it was too good a, a design to miss. So <laughs> they just recreated it anyway, but just nowhere near where it was in the first place. Um, and that's around about 1970. Going on now to, uh, to Germany, because we don't want to knock ourselves for too long. Um, moving on to Germany, <laughs> here is um, a detail from Herrenhausen, uh, which, and the, the great garden there at Herrenhausen has had several phases of restoration in the 1930s, uh, 19, uh, early 1960s, and then in the 1980s. So, you know, so the various overlays of, re of attempts at restoration. And really, that the Great Garden there is a museum of, of restoration mistakes. And uh, in fact, the director of the garden agreed with me that that was quite an apt description of the garden. Um, very typical of the uh, post war attempts at restoration are the concrete edges. Uh, which, of course, now are so offensive uh, to our view. Um, many of these uh, restorations, uh, restoration decisions are taken, of course, not from primarily uh, historical reasons, but also for ease, so-called ease of maintenance. <coughs> Although, in fact, that does not always work. Um, what, what you will find is that if you create an impermeable edge uh, next to a parterre, because people tend to stand on the grass um, rather than the nearest bit of gravel, they're, trampl they're trampling uh, the nearest bit of grass. And it bec because it can't be drained, because you've now put a, an impermeable <laughs> barrier in between it and the, and the, the path, uh, it becomes a little mud bath. So you get a mud bath strip um, wherever there's a, an impermeable edge between gravel and grass. Do you see that little grating in the middle there? Well, that was an attempt at Herrenhausen to suppress weed growth. They thought that, well, if we put in these, this grill, uh, it'll stop the weeds coming through. Well, it might, but it's also, of course, incredibly unsightly when it's not maintained properly, and you can see it poking through. Um, poking through being uh, something that happens to a lot of these uh, modern materials. Um, here is, in fact, an impermeable edge, like that. Um, a very poor little hedge. And there is um, a poorly maintained um, area of, of gravel. So that looks disgusting. Um, and it, when you sort of look at it in detail like that, although, of course, the intention was to make it look magnificent. And there is an attempt to put in a, a bitumen um, edge uh, between the, uh, the grass and the, the soil of the, um, of the plat bond. And what's happened is that it's gradually lifted out of the ground and now, in fact, becomes a prominent feature. Uh, moving on now to Poland, this is a Polish uh, palace in Warsaw. And I, I invite you to spot um, what is, well, you can see what's wrong with this, with the concrete edges. But what is now wrong with that as a topiary parterre? 
Irish Jews, yes, which of course um, didn't exist until, what was it, 1850s or so, 1840s? When did Irish Jews? When? 1780s. So, 1780s, thank you, Jan. Um, and anyhow, they've put back the Irish, <laughs> Irish Jews in this Baroque um, uh, parterre. And this is for you, Jan. Um, this is Hetlo, uh, the pride of um, uh, Dutch garden history. Now, it actually, I think you can't deny it, it looks great. Uh, this is from the roof of the house, and it looks absolutely fantastic. Um, the troubles come again with the details. Um, well, let's carry on admiring the place, because there's a fountain, a fountain to look at. There you are, a great fountain. And there's the, that wonderful... Um, Arbor, which, um, thanks for focusing it. Yep. But you go into the parterre area, um, this one, this area here, and you'll notice certain things that are wrong, um, or that look a bit awkward. First of all, there's the ubiquitous concrete edging. But also, what about the size of these hedges? They're actually far too large. They would never, never have been made this size in the first place. And what that's done, in effect, is create these sort of little voids between the topiary and the, the edge. Don't forget, um, the box is not supposed to be a hedge, it's supposed to be an edge. It is actually supposed to be the edging in itself. Um, and uh, to provide a barrier um, so that the, um, the gravel of the path doesn't get kicked too much into the, the soil of the bed. And what it's done is precluded any opportunity, in fact, for planting, uh, apart from the one piece of topiary. So that, I think, uh, by now, by common consent, is um, a, an early restoration error at um, Hitlow, um, which I think the original project team would have got right uh, if they'd been allowed to, to do so. And then you get these service covers. Um, this, in fact, I think is electricity or lights or something. If you lift one up when nobody's watching, you can see, you can see the electrical points. Was it really necessary to put that in the middle of the path? Um, I mean, you know, actually, if you, if you look at the Hampton Court Privy Garden, you don't realize, in fact, there's a complete sprinkler system uh, in there. It's because uh, tremendous attention was paid to the location of the, the, the sprinkler spouts when they would pop out of the ground. And I don't think the casual visitor would notice. But here, it just hits you in the face. And then there's benches and litter bins, which are unmistakably 20th century. And um, so that's all rather uh, detracts from the overall ambiance. And just so that the Italians don't, don't escape Arda, this is <laughs> Villa Garzoni at Colodi, uh, where... Um, Pinocchio was, uh, came from. Um, well, this, again, is an absolutely wonderful garden, of course, uh, but there was an attempt at restoration of that um, parterre uh, down below. With, and then I can't think what they were doing, because, look, this, this, <laughs> this is actually <laughs> what, what was done. I mean, it has improved since, uh, but this was uh, restoration, parterre restoration, Italian style, ten years ago. You know. I mean, really terrible stuff. Um, Versailles. Um, I'm going to show you two projects now, um, which are blatant um, re reconstructions, uh, or n not even reconstructions, they're modern inventions, which have actually destroyed historic gardens in the attempt to conserve them. And Vers Versailles, um, is now under, undergoing its fourth, no, its fourth version and third destruction. Um, you can't call the exercise over the last 10 years a restoration exercise at Versailles. They have systematically, I'm not exaggerating, they have systematically destroyed the archaeological evidence uh, of the former layers at, at Versailles. They're just not interested in that side of things. They just want a great show at the end of the day. So this is, this is what you have to do to get there. This is the, um, the bosque to the north um, of the, uh, the main block of the palace, going down to the Neptune fountain uh, on the right. 
that is what they have done, um, digging out these vast trenches uh, for the planting of hedges. And you'll notice uh, when you go around, there's an awful lot of concrete, setting concrete, um, to stop people smashing away through these hedges. It could not have been done uh, less sensitively, in my view. And, well, actually, if, that, if the light in here was better, uh, and that came up, you'd see that it looks like the Battle of the Somme. Then we go to a wonderful place in Italy uh, called Venaria Reale. And again, the second year has visited that place. Uh, myself and Brian Dix broke through the security barrier in order to get into the works area. Um, it has a wonderful setting, this place, because although it is billiard table flat uh, on the, the main garden level, nevertheless, there's a, a river terrace down to the river. So you've got, you have actually got views down to the river. But also, in the far distance, these are the Alps. Um, and of course, they are, in fact, some considerable distance away, although on a, looked at on a slide like this, they look next door. But they are, in fact, a long way away. Now, this garden area has indeed um, suffered an enormous level of destruction. In fact, Napoleon deliberately removed the garden for an artillery uh, ground um, back in about 1800. So you can't pretend that you're looking at an existing historic garden. On the other hand, uh, it's quite clear from the aerial photographs that the garden was the garden earthworks in, other, in terms of the, the tree pits, you could see individual tree pits, um, the, the lines of hedges, all the detail of the garden was actually there on aerial photographs. Now, um, what's happened is that uh, monsters like that one on the right here have moved in, and that evidence has been, again, I'm afraid, systematically destroyed in favor of um, new gardens. Uh, I'll just show you, there you are, you see. Now, that has no historical precedent at all. It's just the Italians wanting to make a, a, a new garden. Uh, but this has been funded with European Union money for restoration. Yeah. And th this is what you get. Um, and if you, indeed, if you look, uh, I'll just show you. Uh, yeah. That finger on the right is Brian Dix's. And he's, 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 po he's pointing out the various archaeological layers uh, in the soil that have been... Uh, cut through to put in uh, posts like this one uh, in the middle, which is for a, a modern sort of steel canopy arrangement. Okay, let's go back one or two. Um, it was quite clear from the history, uh, historical record, that even though back in the 1650s, uh, Castellabonte had designed there to be a uh, a great lake in this position, it had never actually been made. And the reason was very clear in retrospect that this was the floodplain. You know, it could never have succeeded. Uh, the river Chironde would have regularly inundated uh, this area. So they did not, in fact, make the great lake or series of lakes that Castellamonte had intended. And there's a good map sequence from the early 18th century right through to the present. Uh, demonstrating this clearly. However, uh, not to be off-put by that, by the actual evidence, uh, the, the team, um, of which I, I regret that I was one until I, <laughs> until I felt I had to uh, absent myself, uh, decided that it would put in this great lake, um, again on some spurious ground of restoration. And um, was it a year ago? The Italians had some of the worst floods they'd ever had. Um, so, you know, the point was proved, I think. Yes, yeah, so th those are the metal posts uh, that uh, were being installed in the trench that um, Brian Dix was, was in. And there, there is the, the end, in fact, of the orangery, uh, the back-to-back -back stables and orangery that um, uh, the second year will remember. Uh, fa fabulously huge and impressive uh, structure. Now, I want to go on to a rationale
for conjectural detailing um, because I think we can do better these days. But let's make one thing uh, clear. Let's clear one preconception out of the way. Um, one is, in fact, seldom uh, seeking to make reconstructions uh, be extremely accurate, although that is possible. Uh, and although I say it myself, and with the Anvazler present, uh, modern standards of archival and comparative research, coupled with the archaeology, can provide a garden almost indistinguishable from the original, as in this garden here, the Privy Garden at Hampton Court. Nevertheless, of course, the very trained eye can still spot uh, the modern features. In effect, you can deceive and do it uh, with conviction. Now, in fact, that is why um, this garden here at Hampton Court was, was dated by putting the date of the garden over the, uh, the portico to the tunnel arbor. Um, so that, and also, of course, it's made clear in the literature this, was actually, this is actually a restoration stroke reconstruction of the mid-1990s. But I want, to make po I want to make clear that in this country, anyway, um, these sort of mass massive reconstructions are comparatively rare, and the real work to be done uh, with conjectural detailing is of, of a rather different nature. Much more commonly, the situation is that of a rundown garden uh, with many of its elements decayed or lost under grass, shrubs, or in the case of water, under reeds. And the issue is how to put the layout that is entrusted to you in a good order. That's the principal issue. That will necessitate reworking uh, many of the details, uh, re relaying the gravel, replanting the shrubbery, cleaning out a pool, repairing an historic building such as a bridge or temple, and replacing sections of boundary walls or rails. This uh, is, of course, the overwhelming situation with urban parks, uh, where the big money is just at the moment um, in restoration. And this was the case with, with storm-damaged properties. As, as Inspector of Historic Parks and Gardens at English Heritage, and responsible for the, the English Heritage effort with storm damage, I became acutely aware of the lack of an intellectually rigorous approach uh, to the replacement of the most ephemeral material of all, of course, the, pl the planted element. And for that reason, I brought in Mark Laird uh, towards the end of my term at English Heritage. Um, I'd known Mark because we'd worked together on Chiswick House grounds, and I knew his work uh, up at York, um, wor working on uh, planting, historical planting design. And I commissioned him uh, to do a study of historical planting uh, in Britain, North America, and in Berlin, where he looked at various attempts uh, to undertake historical planting. And then between us, we came up with a rationale for what could be called conjectural detailing. And it was part of the requirements that he uh, sought publication, which he did, in fact, in various forms in English and German. Now, the rationale um, stems from the viewpoint that conservation in gardens has the following aims, and in, in this order. First of all, is to protect the original fabric for as long as is feasible. Secondly, is to record the original fabric before it has to go. And third, is to conserve the design through repairs. These aims had been emerging from my parallel work in, in, on a general philosophy of restoration, uh, which was um, originally going to be published by English Heritage, but in effect was at length set out in an article in the Journal of Architectural Conservation in 1995. Now, taking the third of these aims to conserve the design, it's clear that repairs will be necessary. Um, could a feature like a path um, that had become grassed over be restored on this justification? Well, yes, uh, very clearly. I think if it's simply a matter that a, a path has become grassed over uh, through neglect, um, and if it can be rediscovered through archaeology, there's no intellectual problem uh, with restoring it. 
If, however, it had been removed by deliberate design decision at some point, then, of course, it becomes trickier, and to reveal it again is a question you're then into, in fact, the dreaded reconstruction. Now, the trickiest question of all was, what about replanting a shrubbery when there was a completely inadequate record of its intended effects? Was this not reconstruction of a sort? Now, reconstruction, remember, is what uh, true conservationists always try to avoid. Now, there's a, there are several important differences, I think, between building uh, philosophy and or building conservation philosophy and garden restoration philosophy. And the building restoration doesn't always provide a, a good model. Two um, main considerations are relevant here. One is that there's, in practice, no clear dividing line between repairs and reconstruction. As the lawyers say, it's really all a matter of fact and degree. So one's, in effect, on a sort of spectrum uh, of the ultimately conservative repair uh, to full-blown restoration. And in any restoration, one is usually involved at different distances along that spectrum for different parts, for different types of material. Um, so you may find the building element is, is uh, more or less preserved and just needs a bit, bit, of, bit of brushing up, whereas the planting has to be completely reinvented. Uh, so you know, it's, uh, with a multi-material um, form of uh, work of art, then you're into, um, you know, the, the question becomes rather complex. The second consideration is that gardens I exist anyway on cycles of renewal. And even if a shrubbery had been recorded exactly at the moment of its first planting, uh, that, would act, that would not in fact be the complete blueprint for the future. It would only ever be a guide to future management. The answer we felt is that conjectural detailing or, or conjectural planting, if that's, you know, planting is all we were doing, could be justified as a conservation activity um, in conserving a design, that is, with provisos. Firstly, that the conclusions from comparative research, and by that I mean research in books of the period and by looking at paintings and other visual material, gave a high level of confidence that the style being followed was in keeping with the aims of putting the historic design back in order. In other words, uh, you are pretty sure the sorts of uh, it, the, s the sort of planting that would have taken place um, at, at the place in question. Secondly, that the decisions on replanting are clearly stated in guidebooks, exhibitions, and so forth, so that the more discerning visitor was was made fully aware of the status of the uh, replanting or new detailing. And thirdly, uh, that the detailing stroke planting is reversible. Because if you, if you find later you've made a mistake, you want to be able to remove what you've done without, in fact, destroying good, good authentic material um, around and about it. Now, as I've implied, uh, conjectural detailing of certainly the, the inert materials that is, the gravels and the, the stones and the bricks and so forth, can be assisted much by modern garden archaeology. Uh, there was a conference on the subject of garden archaeology in 1995, and subsequently, um, an ICOMOS produced guidelines on the, the uses, or the techniques and uses, of garden archaeology. And that is available uh, from ICOMOS. I may even have a few copies around uh, this weekend. And these guidelines state that um, one of the purposes of, of garden archaeology is, quote, restoration purposes, where the features to be recovered are, for example, architectural structures, boundaries, statue bases, and paths, which may need simply to be exposed after a period of, of neglect. So 
So that is why uh, my feeling is that you can see conjectural detailing as an adjunct to uh, a conservation activity. Uh, even though it has many features in common with reconstruction. Nevertheless, I don't think you can sensibly res restore a garden. Um, you, you, can't, you can't just restore the steps and the pergolas and so forth. No, you've actually got to, uh, for the whole field, you've got to carry on with the planting as well. Um, so I, I would see uh, conjectural detailing as a, a necessary adjunct uh, to uh, most uh, garden, res garden conservation, garden restoration. Now, I'd like to, um, in the last part of the uh, lecture, uh, pick up on one or two of the things that Moisson um, said in his introductory remarks. And this is to do with the education in the subject. And higher education, it's quite interesting in the last few years, higher education in historic landscapes and gardens is expanding slightly. I mean, it's never going to be a huge topic. Um, and it, it has been tiny. It's now just a little bit less tiny. Um, and also, the various courses involved are in the process of redefining their roles. I'm not really going to talk about the training of gardeners, because that's a whole other area. I'm really just going to confine my remarks to pro professional uh, training. The York course, um, which Peter Goodchild ran, uh, and then I also ran for four years, uh, has now been relaunched um, at the Department of Archaeology in, in York, and will treat landscapes as an archaeological resource, uh, principally, rather than as a work of art. And that, that is a slight, that's rather a difference from the way that Peter and I used to teach it. Um, although the course will deal, although perhaps somewhat peripherally, with design landscapes. So there is a course um, dealing at least with uh, historic landscape, in general cultural landscapes, should we say, and the conservation of them. Meanwhile, at De Montfort University, uh, Judith Roberts, uh, is developing the research side. So I think that's a potentially a center for garden history research. We have the Birkbeck, which launched its MA last year, had a very encouraging start with a high intake. Now that principally addresses garden history and the conservation content is an int introductory only. Now it's principally a garden history course. That leaves the Architectural Association as the principal taught course uh, for the conservation of designed landscapes. So I think you can see that the, the various institutions are sort of settling out with adjacent and complementary roles. And I think that's very helpful, uh, the way that is, that is happening. The AA course um, started under TED in 1986 with a strong emphasis on history. And although this knowledge had to be turned to the service of conservation, for example, in the dissertation, and I'm sure many of the alumni will remember Ted banging on about how important it is for every, every dissertation to have the uh, conservation element. Well, now the history teaching is being reshaped to make it much more analytical and useful to practicing conservationists. In other words, it's not pure garden history we're going to teach, it's taking it a step further than that, and to try and provide, um, well, I suppose our target audience is the English Heritage Inspector. That's the sort of model we have. What are the historical skills that an English, inspector need, English Heritage Inspector needs to carry out their work? And it's not just garden history. No, that is a platform, but they need skills beyond, over and above and beyond that. There's one module, on the process by which ideas are turned into concrete form. So, I mean, there have been numerous impulses or ideas, or whatever you want to call them, that have, uh, Im that have encouraged people to make gardens in the first place. And we want to explore how that actually happens in reality. And whether, um, for example, you can have two ideas that come up, come up with the same form, 
or one idea that comes up with a variety of forms, which in fact was the case with uh, modernism. Then there's another module on the question of style. Now, if you talk to a landscape architect, they hate being pigeonholed. They, they, they hate being thought that their work is similar to anyone else's. But I'm afraid, from an historian's point of view, um, uh, that's, um, one has to get beyond uh, the individual preferences of the landscape architect to see themselves as unique and special and acknowledge that, in fact, there are styles at various periods. But it becomes a question as to, how, to, to what degree does a discussion of style help or hinder in the analysis of historic, um, historic garden uh, designs. In many cases, it is a great help because uh, certainly once you recognize the key characteristics of, say, the English Landscape Park, um, you, know, you can look at a map and you can say, oh, yes, well, uh, this is a garden, of, without actually knowing the history, but just by reading a map and visiting the site, you can say, well, this is a, a layout of three different periods. Um, there's this Relict Avenue, which must mean that it had an, an earlier formal design. There's the Landscape Park. And then there's a Vic Victorian parterre that's come back in close to the house. Uh, you don't need to be a genius to, to uh, read the signs um, on, the, on the ground and on the maps. And that is done, of course, through your understanding of style. Nevertheless, um, when it comes to some of the finer decisions, the more difficult ones, um, style isn't necessarily such a help. And we want to look into the limits to um, the use of style. And the third element will be world heritage. Now, you may know that quite a few landscapes these days are now on the world heritage list. Um, and in 1992, the World Heritage Convention was changed um, to allow design landscapes to be on the world heritage list. Up to that point, there was no actual um, scope. The, wor the wording of the convention did not actually allow for design landscapes or even cultural landscapes uh, to be on the World Heritage List, and that was changed in 1992. And there's been quite a push in the last 10 years to identify landscapes that are suitable for World Heritage status. Now, I don't want to make any great claims of the World Heritage System, beca because it is actually quite a deeply political process. Um, and some funny decisions come out of it. But I think it's quite a useful way um, of looking at, by looking at World Heritage Sites, to ask the question, well, what makes a landscape special uh, in its own terms? You know? Of the 100 or 200 examples of this type of landscape, um, how can we pick out the, the few that should be acknowledged, should be acknowledged on a world scale? And of course, this is done by garden writers, I know people select the world's best 100 gardens and all that sort of stuff. So people are doing it, but on a fairly sort of unsystematic way. And I think by looking at world heritage, one can get some insights, uh, perhaps a slightly more objective uh, insight, into what it takes to make places special. Um, anyhow, so we're going to get away from straight garden history uh, teaching. And we, ex we would expect people to come on the course having read some of the books already before they come on the course so that they can um, start straight away on these more analytical aspects. The conservation teaching, meanwhile, addresses the practical inspectorial skills in things like doing a site description, historical reports, evaluation according to criteria, um, management plans, protection, presentation, and grant schemes. And that, in fact, is what we already do um, in the, on the conservation side. Now, in, um, in 1999, two years ago, the, our validating body, which is the Open University, uh, visited us and gave us validation. And in fact, the, the second year that's now, now has submitted their, uh, their dissertations is the first year that we'll have the, the validated course. And I think it was important to sort of benchmark uh, where we were in terms of the quality of the teaching. It means that we're at least as good as um, a university course of the same status. However, we've made a judgment that an MA is important and desirable. 
both, be, both because I think a, a rounded program in garden conservation would include the practical skills in specifying restoration works uh, because after all um, conservation remains a sort of theoretical exercise until you can actually do it in practice until you can actually get those gardens maintained or restored to the standards you need. So we want to add, a, uh, add another section on the uh, teaching uh, to do with practical restoration. And also, the MA was important because I think these days uh, people seem to want uh, the MA rather than a postgraduate diploma. Um, so, um, so if that's what people want, then I think they should have it. Furthermore, the MA, doing an MA would give us the opportunity for a full-time course. Uh, at the moment, of course, we're part-time. Um, so doing the MA would give us the opportunity for a full-time course. And those who did the diploma part-time would actually also be able to then go on to the, the MA. Um, so, fingers crossed, we've got the validating body visiting again in a few months. So with any luck, we should be in place um, next year, October next year, with um, an MA with one third of it being in restoration uh, detailing. And Jan at the, at the back there has sort of masterminded the course content um, into uh, the main themes. And research is obviously a, a major aspect to it, um, the comparative research. Um, and then there's materials, uh, looking at the various materials available. And then there's contract documentation, um, actually being able to churn out the, uh, the documentation that contractors uh, can use. Um, that will be the main part of the third term. And those people who have no previous experience in using AutoCAD and <coughs> other forms of computer-aided uh, drafting will be taught from the start in order to get them up to speed. So those, that's the future of this course. And so we're seeing, this, we're seeing today and tomorrow as uh, not just a good opportunity for um, a conference, but also it provides us with some feedback and some opportunity um, on the subject of how we actually teach the, uh, restoration detailing. And if any of you have any thoughts on this topic, do talk to myself uh, or Jan at the back. Uh, Jan, could you stand up? Yeah. <laughs> there. And or, or to Ted over here, because we'd be only too, only too glad uh, to get some, some response. Uh, from you. Right, Ted. Well, thank you for your reading. Raspberry, have you got news? Yes, well, sadly, Lord Roby is unwell. Um, no. And not allowed to be unwell. That's uh, very odd. Um, we do have one further point to make. Um, in previous years, we've done, the, um, done three days of conference. Um, the third day has been a visit. In fact, I think last year we took a boat up the river, and that's why we lost money last year. Um, but um, this year, there's really no point in that, because, of course, on Sunday, you will perhaps all know, or some of you at least should know, that it's the London Squares Day. And it's a good opportunity to visit uh, London Squares uh, on this one day of a year. I'm going to ask the chairman of the London Historic Parks and Gardens Trust to say a few words um, on that. Barbara. Uh, yes, Sunday is London Garden Square Day. Thank you. Oh, you can turn it off. Uh, which I, I think some of you will, I hope a lot of you, will have heard about on the radio and television over the last few days. Now this is a joint initiative between the London Historic Parks and Gardens Trust and English Heritage. Uh, it's been a tremendous success over the last three years. This is our fourth London Garden Squares Day and it gives people the opportunity to visit hidden green spaces in London. Uh, there are nearly 70 squares which are taking, place this, uh, taking part this year 
and 60 of those are private squares, which are only opening to the public on this one special day. Um, as well as giving you an opportunity to enjoy their green space, they are providing a number of activities. Uh, traditional activities such as strawberry, cream teas, uh, PIMS tastings, uh, there's also Punch and Judy shows, uh, Scottish dancing uh, and musical events. Um, the proceeds uh, will go to squares and to green organisations that care for London's garden heritage. The tickets cost £5 and that gives you access to all the squares that are participating. Um, there's also this booklet, which I think many of you have got already, which show you where the squares are, what activities they're providing, and how to get there. Now, it's going to be a tremendous day. Uh, it's been billed as a garden party for London, so please do support us. Um, the tickets uh, will be available, I think, at the desk outside, or you can uh, get them from me today, or you can buy them at the first square you visit uh, on Sunday. So do join us. Thank you. Is this square open? No. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that awful? They've got another event. They were going to take part, but they've now There's got a another There's a large event. marquee in the middle. That's right, yeah. Very good. Well, as we hear, Lorna McGrabby ain't well. But that we have got from Germany, Clemens Wimmer. Thank goodness they're not a hill in Germany. And here are the slides. He is, as you will see from your piece of paper. I, are we ready for tea? I don't think we are. We, I think we better carry on. I have two things. A landscape historian and architect, and he has specializing on 18th century planting schemes, on which he's written a book. You can see that's called Trees and Shrubs in Historic Gardens, published in German. We are hopeless linguists. But I do hope that some of you will be able to pick up on that book, nevertheless. So, Clements, if you would like to come and talk to us now, we'd be very grateful. On that? At first, I have to thank for the kind invitation. Then I have to apologize for my deficient knowledge in English. Now I, my home is at Potsdam, formerly at Berlin. My daily subjects are conservation of gardens, garden theory, bibliography, and my special interest is in plant history and in the history of planting. Now, uh, five chapters on planting design in 18th century and 50 slides. If you have a number of plants, there is a question how to plant them. This question is not a modern one, but a very old one. Thinking about solutions is recorded since the time of Renaissance. Have you ever planned uh, to plant singularly to, to, to contrast with the next one? Or have you to group more plants of the same kind together. Which system of order is to be adopted, a regular one or an irregular one? 
To understand the 18th century planting system, it is necessary to look at the former periods. There was not so, uh, such a great change in planting as generally supposed. The Garden Revolution in 18th century was not a revolution in planting, but mere, merely a change of the outlines of plantings. The matter of this lecture is the close connection between the formal flower bed and border and the clump and shrubbery in the landscape garden. John Harris, David Jacks, Mark Laird and others have focused these phenomena in England. My own studies has very resembling results in other countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Poland and France. Chapter one, the flower bed in the Renaissance. The classical plant bed is an elevated piece of earth between wooden edges or lower plant rows, prevailing from the ancient till the medieval. In the Renaissance, the outlines of the bed became more sophisticated. This is a garden in, um, uh, in Itzstein, very uh, curious forms, not geometrical, but uh, in the forms of fruits, of apples and pears. Uh, the beds became more sophisticated to construct ornamental pater patterns. The edges were bordered with herbs as, as such as lavender, rue, sage, thyme, hyssop, or periwinkle. Only few hints on the arrangement of flowers within the beds are recorded. It seems that several systems of arrangement were accepted. The German author Peter Laurenberg wrote in 1631, either flowers of a single species can be planted in one bed, or, and this would be the better way, the species can be mixed together, so that always something in the bed is flowering. In the middle of the bed, he planted a shrub or a greenhouse plant. This is Altdorf, 1660. Uh, then, uh, Laurenberg wrote, carnations at certain places and the rest can be filled with bulbs and annuals without any order. As you see, the ever-flowering garden is not a modern invention of 20th century, but a very old one. A planting scheme from the time of Renaissance is preserved at Hamburg Archives. It shows perennials and flowers in mostly rect rectangular, partly irregular clusters, in some way remembering to Jekyll's flower drifts. Color drifts, sorry. Other artists preferred a symmetrical planting of flowers in grids or rows. This is Ankelmann's Garden Hamburg, but it seems that the symmetry never was a complete one. It was broken at several places. This is to seen in this uh, garden layout, Ankelmann's Garden Hamburg. If you compare uh, this place or another, the symmetry is always not uh, complete. Flower beds survived during the Baroque time in the secret garden hidden by walls. This is Leiden, Holland. Here so-called pièce coupé contained flowers between bordure made of box like formerly in the Renaissance garden. Chapter two, the Baroque, Baroque border. Olivier de Serre first re recommended to put colored gravel at the surface 
to en enhance the ornamental shapes of the beds in 1600. Since Jacques Boisseau, 1638, the beds were but mere ornaments filled with, with gravel instead of flowers. This form of beds was later on called broderie and was always bordered by dwarf, dwarf bucks. The connecting embroidered uh, pictures were named caro or tableau. These tableaux were bordered in older times with hedges of a taller plant and later on bordered with plot board. Now these plot board were the only places in the parterre containing flowers. Bulbs and perennials were arranged in a grid manner, each plant neighbored by another species and another color. The tallest in the middle and the lower ones on the side rows. In the middle, all the topiaries, flowering shrubs, or orangery plants might be included. Special effects could be aimed at if shrubs and tubs were set in the borders during the flowering time only, as uh, gala roses are preserved uh, too in, also in, in tubs and at this time. Richard Bradley described this manner and Abbe Pluche from France also did. Uh, he wrote Laurus Tinus flowering in the early spring was replaced by lilac alternating with white and blue flowers, then gelder roses, honeysuckle and jessamine and so on, all mixed with traditional orangery plants like citrus, citrus, a bay or pomegranate. Des Alliés d'Argentville mentioned planting schemes for springtime, summer, and autumn. The aim of the border was a perpetual flowering without unoccupied places, not the scarceness of plants. All col colors were mixed. A planting scheme from this time here is uh, for bulbs dating from 1693, preserved from Trianon. Another planting scheme, most famous by Louis Leger, Le Jardinier Fleuriste, include, uh, uh, include uh, um, in his book from uh, dating uh, 1604. You have an English version also. Not only flowers, but also trees and sh shrubs and top plants were arranged in such a manner. Uh, this is Peter Laurenberg, 1631. Uh, uh, um, a planting scheme for orchards. Oh, this is uh, a picture from Volkammer, um, an orangery arrangement at Verona, 1713. Uh, or oh, uh, this plan from Hanover, Herrnhausen, dating from 1667. Attention uh, is to, to given to the uh, conical and spherical forms in uh, um, alternating. The general planting system of the Baroque period was a regular mix mixture or a rose melange as La Cantini said. Plantations of mast flowers of one kind were not usual in the 18th century. Chapters three, transition forms of the Rococo garden. The earliest planting schemes for graduated woody plants were invented for that kind of formal garden, which may be called Rococo garden. 
Also, the gardeners have uh, used more plant species as their predecessors. Flowers and flowering trees and shrubs were highly esteemed. The assortment which was enriched by new introductions mainly from North America. And uh, collectors like Archibald, Duke of Argyll in Britain, Scotland, Lord Peter at Thornton Hall, Charles Hamilton at Painsill, Philip Dothcote at Warburn Farm, and others began to collect exotic trees. The London gardeners, therefore, in 1730, reclaimed the poorly furnished gardens were surpassed. These new plants were grouped into the traditional regular grid and a astonishing fixture dating from 1727 shows exotic trees in a baroque parterre. Trees with colored leaves stand in triangular beds, trees with double flowers in square beds, and trees uh, with unusually formed leaves in circular ones. The sh shrubs and the climbers stand in oblong borders, and the main axis is accentuated by evergreen trees. Another transition form is a parterre consisting only of flowers or flowering shrubs, as occurs after 730. We can see such forms at Chantilly Gardens or at Benfica, Portugal. Here is a, a parterre compartment only consisting of flowers. Another uh, feature of the Rococo garden is the Corbeil de Fleur flower basket occurring in mid-18th century. It has several levels. It's to be shown in this picture or a single one as to be seen at Rheinsberg, northern Germany. The margin was made from wirework painted of from trellis work. These baskets are placed in the main parterre instead of in secret gardens. The trees of an avenue, avenue were often alternated by shrubs like roses here in Trianon and climbers were set at the stems of the lime trees. Um, John Lawrence recommended first an amphitheater of variegated plants in 1716. In a little square place, he wrote, the walls might be covered with variegated shrubs, and in the front, variegated perennials and bulbs were planted. The English shrubbery developed step by step from the French bosquet. First, Thomas Fairchild recommended in 1722 to graduate the trees from the middle to the margin of the quarters, in the same way as the flowers were graduated in the Baroque border. Betty Langley describes in 1728 a promiscuous or intermixed manner of planting for the wilderness. He divided the trees and shrubs into three rows behind a low hedge. And Philip Miller published in 1731 his famous planting scheme in his article Wilderness from his Gardener's Dictionary. Wilderness is nothing else but the French bosquet. Miller criticized the old formal wilderness 
with elevated edges and a filling mix of trees and shrubs without any order. His wilderness has no hedge, but a gradually sloped verdure. The traditional sense of order led him to a separation of deciduous and evergreen schemes. No stems should be vis vis visible. Miller published lists of evergreen and deciduous trees and shrubs classified into four groups by height. Later authors distinguished up to seven ranges as did the German Otto von Münchhausen. Spe special lists by Miller are dedicated to variegated plants, to climbers, to perennials, greenhouse plants, and so on. The copper plates given by James Meader, 1779, show the disposition of evergreens and deciduous trees exactly in the same manner described by Miller, but with seven ranges. Primroses, violets, daffodils, and other wood flowers, according to Miller, should be planted in a natural manner in front of the shrubs. Climbers could be used on the stems and shrubs. The outlines of the trees should alternate from plant to plant. In the same way, the colors of the foliage should alternate. For the next decade, the look, looking at the several tints of foliage and greenery in a picturesque manner and distribution was a general intention of all gardeners. Miller's scheme was invented for serpentine path in the formal wilderness and therefore the rows of the planting also have to curve like Hogarth's uh, line of beauty. But nevertheless, as m it, it makes little difference if the scheme would be used in irregular or in rect rectangular designs. The great influence of Miller's scheme can be seen, for example, in Germany down to the early 19th century. For nearly 100 years, it was a model for European gardeners. Chapter 4, flowers, flower beds in landscaped surroundings. Flower enthusiasts like John Spencer and William Gilpin created new flower gardens in mid-18th century. The former John Spencer, still in a somewhat formal manner, and the latter William Gilpin in a thoroughly informal manner. But both, they mixed the flowers together and arranged them by height and color, like on the baroque border. Occasionally, flower beds found their way out from the closed flower garden to the open landscape garden, sparingly scattered on the turf, uh, mostly around the house and near the path. This is a uh, shock from Wurlitz garden. Such rounded beds were planted in, in, circ in, in, in circles um, depending on the extension of the spe species, the plants were set by one to ten specimens. The nurseryman Nathaniel Swindon, 1778, gives us uh, lists of flowers arranged according to heights and colors in six classes. One, two, four, three, five, six. And his borders and beds therefore have six ranges. Never two plants of the same color or form should be grouped together. Repetition of species was permitted only on the margin as an additional bordering line. Swinton states, the more diversified the colors, the more agreeable and pleasant is the appearance. 
The aim of the graduation was to display different aspects of flowering and color during all seasons. And as William Forscheid said, the different plants may be readily distinguished. Chapter five, clumps and shrubberies. In early landscape gardens, a clump contained many tall trees of one species, mostly circularly grouped or in a square like in Blenheim Place. <coughs> Samuel Johnson defined a clump, quotation, as a shapeless piece of wood or other matter nearly equal in its dimensions. This is Dumont de Courset's garden dating from late 18th century and having uh, circular clumps. <coughs> the advocates of the picturesque like Juftel Price and Richard Payne Knight refused such forms. <coughs> Knight said this form a lump which the improver plants and called the clump. The clump was improved as a group of two or more trees, irregularly grouped, and eventually of different species. This is Laudan, 1804, with uh, grouping and dotting, and the, the clumping and dotting, and the right way is grouping as below. Theoretically, Betty Langley claimed so early as in 1728 to plant the trees not according to the common method, like an orchard, I quote, with their trees and straight lines ranging every way, but in a rural manner, as if, if, as if they had received their situation from nature itself. But 10 years later, Lord Peter still planted evergreen clumps consisting of two or more species of trees grouped in regular circles. Only since the mid of 18th century, Brown and others designed informal groups. Waitley recommends to neighbor similar but no equal plant forms and structures together. According to this postulate, deciduous trees and conifers did not harmonize. An anonymous author from Vienna illustrated the principle of harmonizing foliage in, on several plates. One group of harmonizing foliage, another, a third, and so on. Another improved type contained besides trees and shrubs perennials too. This could be named both clump or shrubbery. Thomas Jefferson, for example, used the terms clump and bed as synonyms because both contained all classes of plants. The term shrubbery first occurred by uh, first used by William Shenston in 1748. A shrubbery can follow either a circuit walk or the margin of a wood, or it can be isolated on the turf as a clump. This is Isabella Czartoryska. The principle of mixture in these clumps or shrubberies was the same as in flower beds and borders. It was adapted from the Rococo wilderness by trans transferring, transferring its grid into round or curved outlines separated by lawn. We find the same regular mixed planting, the heights graduated from the middle to the edge. The shrubbery is only distinct from the formal wilderness by its outlines. 
Nice Planting Schemes were published by Johann Georg Schoch from Berlitz Gardens in 1794. He distinguished an evergreen shrubbery contrasted by single deciduous trees and uh, deciduous shrubbery contrasted by single evergreen trees. But the best uh, planting schemes are published by the Polish princess Isabella Czartoryska so late as in 1804, uh, sorry, 1805. Her clams contain all classes of plants, deciduous and evergreen trees, flowering shrubs, perennials and annuals. I have hoped uh, this marvelous book would be reprinted sometimes uh, with an English tr translation, but uh, <laughs> I hope anymore. Um, the gardeners of Paris used 18th century schemes till today. It is clear that such clumps have to be often clipped and modified. The relative coherence of all planting systems described in this lecture is due to the modest assortment available in the 18th century and which cannot be compared with the assortment of 19th century. A real new way of using trees and shrubs arose with the sentiment, sentimental landscape garden. Now trees uh, became a special significance. The Lombardian poplar, for example, is sublime. Or if you see a weeping willow, you have to weep. <laughs> the in individual features of trees were exactly analyzed and combined. The painters displayed the several sorts of verdure very scrupulously, as to be seen in the pictures by Salomon Gessner. The single specimen has been invented. This is Charteriska, and the single tree have to be picturesque, even damages. Most picturesque groups in the 18th century consist of one species, beach by beach and fur by fur. This is Hirschfeld. But in some cases, striking combinations, as here uh, Charteriska, were risked. Several rules occurred how to group single trees in a picturesque manner and finally you will find picturesque planting schemes very similar to the all geometric ones. This is an, an example from Hirschfeld. Thank you. I thought that was the most fantastic display of different of knowledge that has never come our way before. You saw more pictures of different kinds of planting than I have ever seen brought together previously. Quite remarkable. And I think we are going to uh, want to talk to you quite a bit about this. And as Lorna McGrebby has given us that opportunity, my suggestion now is that we go and have coffee and that you and Jan Wildstra, who seems to be un sitting there at the back, should be prepared to, to talk to us together and answer some questions which must have been prompted in our minds by your talk. And we get that hot while we're still thinking and still remembering what you said 
I think it would be extremely valuable to have a little discussion period on what you have just told us. Do you all agree that that would be a useful thing? Good. There seems to be a saturation for yes. So let us now go and have our coffee and reassemble and talk again afterwards.